with a look at the PIP joint to see why this is such an obstinate joint. The PIP joint is a hinge joint and what that means is that the concavity in the middle phalanx, this is the middle phalanx, this is the base, this is the proximal phalanx, and this is the head of the proximal phalanx. So the concavities on each side of the base of the middle phalanx, except the convexity of the head of the proximal phalanx. So there's a very tight bony relationship. The fact that there are these two condyles fitting within their spaces means that this is an extremely stable joint. There's almost no translation laterally or deviation because of the tight fit. This tight bony fit in addition to the surrounding soft tissues provide a secure construct so this joint has very little motion other than in flexion and extension. What this means, however, is because there's very little motion available, is that any sort of force crossing the PIP joint in a plane other than flexion and extension is very poorly tolerated. And it's for that reason that we frequently see injuries to the PIP joint. Here the schematic drawing shows us some of the key structures making up the PIP joint. The middle phalanx is here, which means that the end of the finger would be out this way. Proximal phalanx here with the metacarpal phalangeal joint in this direction. Holding these joints together are two ligaments, the proper collateral ligament and the accessory collateral ligament. But in addition to these ligaments, there are many tissues surrounding the joint that make up the joint capsule. So it is not just ligaments that provide support to the joint. The central slip is the primary tendon which is coming through the dorsal apparatus and is inserting into the base of the middle phalanx. Many say that this is the PIP joint extensor, but as we look at this more carefully, we will see that it is not the sole source of PIP joint extension. The flexor tendons do not insert near the volar plate other than the superficialis, which is not drawn here, which does insert just distal to the PIP joint. The volar plate is a proportionally large structure on the volar aspect of the joint, which normally prevents hyperextension of the joint. But when the volar plate is injured or there's been trauma to the joint, it is often the volar plate that loses its ability to fold and flex during uh, interphalangeal joint flexion and then to fully extend during finger extension. The synovial space filled with synovial fluid surrounds the joint, as one would expect, in addition to which there is a synovial lining to the tendon sheath which provides lubrication for the flexor tendons crossing the joint. If one looks at the PIP joint, one thinks of it as a joint that is constructed with very little tolerance. The ligaments provide stability in both extension and full flexion, but there is no rotation available and there's no deviation or translation available. The volar plate is the one structure that can be most persistent in making the gains of PIP extension very difficult. But it's important to keep in mind that it's never just one structure. If the joint is injured, there is adherence between the multiple tissue layers, that, for example, the dorsal apparatus, which is over this entire area, needs to move both uh, distally during flexion and proximally during extension. And if there's injury to this joint or immobility of this joint, the dorsal apparatus becomes adherent.
as do all of the other structures surrounding the joint. Normally, there's differential movement between tissue layers. That's what allows movement to occur. But immobilization or injury, either one, creates a situation where those tissues become inherent one to another, and that limits motion. Human tissue, however, responds to stress that is applied to it. So if we're able to apply stress appropriately to a stiff joint, and in this case specifically the PIP joint, we can recreate the differential glide of the tissue layers, which then recreates the normal active motion. Here we look an, at an anatomical specimen. Here is a cross-sectional view looking laterally, and you can see how tightly constructed the joint is. There's relatively little joint contact, but this surface is in an arc such that it does allow the hyperflexion we're accustomed to at the PIP joint. Part of the volar plate here has been removed during the dissection. It's not as easy to see, but we do see the superficialis insertion clearly, as well as the central slip insertion. This is an interesting photograph because it's looking end on onto the base of the middle phalanx. In other words, the head of the proximal phalanx here would fit down into this space. This shows you how tightly constructed this is. Here we see an outline of the dorsal apparatus going over at least half of the circumference of that proximal phalanx. In the middle of that is the central slip, which is continuation of the extensor digitorum communis, but these are not totally separate structures. They move together. Volarly, we see both the uh, superficialis and the profundus tendons in cross-section within the flexor tendon sheath. We see the collateral ligaments on both sides of the joint. And volarly, we see a rather significantly thick volar plate. It's all of these structures in combination that provide stability to the PIP joint. Here we see a lateral view of the PIP joint with a probe in place underneath the collateral ligament. You can see that there's tension in the collateral ligament and extension as there is inflection. So that tension is approximately equal in both positions, unlike some of the other finger joints. Here we see that some of the synovium has been removed from around the joint, whereas here it has remained intact. And we can see that the joint itself, with just the ligament, still has relative stability. Looking more closely, we see a bit more detail of the collateral ligaments and their tenacious strength. However, because the finger is a lever arm that's often unprotected, these collateral ligaments are vulnerable to injury. In a recent study, Hess and Associates looked at the relative pressure within the PIP joint. So if you will follow this color scale, looking at the blue as being the furthest apart and the red as closest together, you can see that in extension, the finger surface with the radial aspect and the volar aspects labeled is relatively far apart. These are 15 degree increments. And you can see then when you reach sort of the mid-range, there starts to be pressure interestingly on the radial aspect and that pressure becomes less and it becomes better distributed in full flexion. As we all know, the PIP joint frequently is resistant to full extension. Flexion contractors are extremely common and are very frustrating. That's why we can call this the obstinate PIP joint. In my opinion, there are three core reasons why PIP extension is so difficult to regain. 
The first is a natural imbalance between the extrinsic and intrinsic power. The second is a natural tendency of adherence of the dorsal apparatus. And the third is a very natural hyperextension of the MP joint. The lack of full PIP flexion can be attributed to a strong MP joint flexion with the interosseous muscles first that leaves little room for interphalangeal joint flexion to full range and perhaps adherence of the extrinsic flexors within the finger, which does not allow the patient to initiate with the extrinsic flexors. Now, as we said, normal mechanics show that the flexor tendons are mechanically efficient. They are a large extrinsic muscle with significant excursion which transmit force through a very efficient pulley system such that in the position of full finger flexion this pulley closes any gaps that it may have and maintains the tendon against the bone for maximum power. After all, we can hang the weight of our body on our finger interphalangeal joints. That has to mean that there is significant strength in our extrinsic flexors. Extension of the finger is an extremely complex interplay of the fibers of the dorsal apparatus. We will discuss this in some uh, detail in this presentation, but if you really want to investigate this uh, in depth, you may wish to look at the finger series available uh, as part of our video collection. The intrinsic muscles, which are seen here colored primarily blue and green, are the primary power available for interphalangeal joint extension. As we will clearly see, the extensor digitorum communis is usually busy extending the MP joint and has very little power left to be transmitted into the dorsal apparatus. For that reason, I do not consider the extensor digitorum communis a primary interphalangeal joint extensor in the normal finger.